Hello, this is Dr. Anthony Loham. The purpose of this slide presentation is to describe the procedure of colonoscopy. During the colonoscopy procedure, a flexible camera is inserted into the anus and rectum. The camera is then advanced to the first portion of the colon known as the cecum. In the cecum, we look for typical landmarks including the opening of the appendix and the ileocecal valve. These are demonstrated in the photograph on the bottom right. The camera is then carefully withdrawn with examination of the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. In the rectum, the scope is also retroflexed. This is demonstrated in the photograph on the top right. This visualizes the internal hemorrhoid tissue and also ensures we do not miss any polyps distal in the rectum. Finally, the air is removed and the procedure is complete. There are three categories of colonoscopy we perform. First, a typical screening colonoscopy is done for either average risk patients or high risk patients. Second is a surveillance colonoscopy. And finally, a diagnostic colonoscopy. Most patients who present for screening colonoscopy are average risk. The recommendations are to initiate screening colonoscopy at the age of 50 and proceed until the age of 75. Although the American Cancer Society has recently recommended starting screening colonoscopies at the age of 45. On the other end of the age spectrum, we look carefully at a patient's comorbid conditions and overall health and make a determination with the patient's primary care provider and in discussions with the patient whether it is beneficial to proceed. Typically, screening colonoscopy in average risk patients is performed every 10 years. Some patients who present for screening colonoscopy are considered high risk. These patients undergo more frequent screening colonoscopy exams. The most common category of these patients are individuals with a family history of colon cancer in a first degree relative. This includes brother, sister, mother, father. This is more significant if the first degree relative experienced a diagnosis of colon cancer under the age of 60. In patients with inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, more frequent screening examinations are performed because of a higher incidence of colorectal cancer. And finally, there are some hereditary colon cancer syndromes, the most common being hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or HNPCC. When a patient with a personal history of colon polyps or colon cancer undergoes colonoscopy, we use the term surveillance colonoscopy. For example, if somebody is diagnosed with colon cancer and undergoes surgical treatment, we perform a surveillance colonoscopy one year after the surgery. The interval is then increased to three years and finally five years. In patients with a personal history of colon polyps, the surveillance interval is determined by multiple factors. This includes the number of colon polyps removed, the size of the individual polyps, and most importantly, the pathologic characteristics of the polyps. When polyps are removed, we are typically looking for a pathologic diagnosis known as adenoma polyps. Adenoma polyps are a risk factor for colon cancer. Tubular adenoma polyps are very common, but have a very low probability of developing into cancer. Villus adenoma polyps are uncommon, but have a high risk of colon cancer development. The interval to follow-up surveillance colonoscopy is determined by all of these factors. The final category of colonoscopy is known as a diagnostic colonoscopy. This is typically done in patients referred by their primary care physician with clinical symptoms that may be related to abnormalities of the colon. This may include a change in bowel habits, including diarrhea or constipation, gross bleeding, including hematochesia, which is bright red blood, typically with a bowel movement, melana, which is dark blood, or the patient may have evidence of anemia on blood testing. 
In other cases, normal appearing stool undergoes a evaluative test for blood known as the IFOB or hemocult test. This may indicate underlying polyps or cancer. And finally, patients may present with a new onset of abdominal pain or an abnormal CT scan or other imaging where the primary care physician requests further evaluation with diagnostic colonoscopy. The colonoscopy procedure is performed at the Lander Outpatient Surgical Center. On the date of your procedure, you will register and then be placed in a private room by the nursing staff. A nurse will place an IV and my anesthesia provider will evaluate you and discuss the procedure. I also personally reevaluate every patient. The nurse will then bring you to the procedure room and the anesthesia staff will hook you to a monitor to include blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen level. The anesthesiologist will then administer a type of sedation known as propofol. No patients ever have any discomfort during the procedure and the medication wears off quite quickly so that most patients are ready to leave the facility within 30 to 60 minutes. The average colonoscopy procedure length is 15 to 30 minutes. The main focus of a screening or surveillance colonoscopy is to identify and remove colon polyps. As we have discussed, we are specifically looking for colon adenoma polyps. For patients presenting for initial screening colonoscopy, at least 25% will have at least one polyp. An attempt is made during colonoscopy to remove all polyps that are identified. If I identify a polyp during the colonoscopy exam, an attempt is made to completely remove the polyp. Several techniques are utilized to perform this procedure. First is a cold biopsy. A cold biopsy is a small biopsy device that is passed through the endoscopic channel and one or more bites of the tissue are performed until it appears the polyp is completely removed. For larger polyps, I most commonly perform a snare polypectomy. A snare polypectomy device is a device which is also passed through the colonoscope channel and a wire or loop is tightened around the polyp. We then use thermal or heat energy to remove the polyp. In both cases, I may elect to place a hemostatic clip. A hemostatic clip is a small staple or clip which is placed on the polypectomy site to minimize the risk of bleeding. These images demonstrate a cold biopsy for polyp removal and a hemostatic clip placement. In the photograph on the left, the biopsy devices are angled toward the mucosal polyp. The polyp is removed, and after removal, there is a small area of bleeding. A hemostatic clip is applied, and the procedure is complete. These images demonstrate a snare polypectomy. On the left is a larger polyp. The snare device is inserted and tightened around the base of the polyp, and heat energy or cautery is used for polyp removal. Finally, a hemostatic clip is applied. If you closely look at the tissue around the base of the hemostatic clip, you will see white tissue. This is the cauterized tissue from the heat or thermal energy. If polyps are removed during a colonoscopy procedure, they are sent to a pathologist for microscopic examination. The pathologist will give us a final diagnosis. There are various polyp types as we have previously discussed. In some cases, polyps will have a hyperplastic pathology. Hyperplastic polyps are not typically a risk factor for colon cancer and surveillance colonoscopy is not warranted. In other cases, we may remove a tubular adenoma, which is very common, but has a low risk of colon cancer development, or a villus adenoma, which is less common, but has a higher risk of colon cancer development. Another type of polyp we commonly see is known as a serrated adenoma polyp. 
Serrated adenoma polyps are also a risk for colon cancer, but take a different genetic pathway to cancer development. We then determine the appropriate time for surveillance colonoscopy based on the various characteristics, the number of polyps, and the size of the polyps. This is then communicated to the patient and to the patient's referring primary care provider. There are some risks associated with the colonoscopy procedure. The most serious potential complication is perforation of the colon. A recent large study from a single institution indicated the risk of perforation was one out of 1,750 colonoscopies. In most cases, a perforation occurs during a therapeutic colonoscopy. A therapeutic colonoscopy means that at some point during the colonoscopy, an intervention is performed, such as cold biopsy, snare polypectomy, or tattoo injection for localization of a polyp site. In 20 years, I have performed over 6,000 colonoscopies, and I have had two patients with colon perforations. My incidence of colon perforation is lower than the reported incidence in all surgical or endoscopic literature. The second potential complication during colonoscopy is bleeding. Again, this happens almost 100% when a therapeutic intervention such as biopsy is performed. If a polypectomy or polyp removal is performed, bleeding can occur in with a rate of one out of 125 colonoscopies. It can occur the same day of the procedure or up to seven days later. The use of hemostatic clips on polypectomy sites can significantly reduce the bleeding risk. From my standpoint, in the past, I would typically have one patient per year return to my office or the emergency room with symptoms of bleeding. I have only had to repeat the colonoscopy on one patient in a 20-year period to control a bleeding site. In most cases, the bleeding is limited. Thank you. I hope you found this PowerPoint presentation informative in educating you on the colonoscopy procedure. I am always available, as is my office staff, to answer additional questions or concerns that may arise. Have a good day.